This episode of the House of Mystery is brought to you by Legacy Food Storage. The best way to protect your family is by being prepared. LegacyFoodStorage.com This, Justin, you are looking at a, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center, and we have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. What are you doing that requires you to cover up everything? What purpose did this ritual serve? Only the Illuminati really know. Manchurian candidates. Could such things actually be possible? A short flight from Las Vegas, deep in the Nevada desert, lies Area 51, the CIA's secret. My voice is beamed into the rain, like it was whispering in my ear. Here's a bulletin from CBS News. President Kennedy has been the victim of an assassin's bullet in Dallas, Texas. It is not known as yet whether the president survived the attack against him. Of going down the rabbit hole. You have now entered into the house of mystery. The best in true crime, conspiracy, and alternative history. With Al Warren and Kevin Thompson. KCAA, the stations that leave no listener behind. Broadcasting on 10.50 a.m., 102.3 f.m., and 106.5 f.m. The trifecta of talk radio for Southern California. Welcome back into the House of Mystery on KKNW 1150 AM Seattle and KCAA 106.5 FM Los Angeles. I'm Al Warren, and of course, joining me, Kev Thompson. Hey, Al. It's hey. me. Hey. Hey. Getting lots of compliments online. <laughs> that's, I'm just going to call myself Snowflake from now on, okay? Uh, <laughs> that's what I hear. Pretty that's, good show for a snowflake. That's two, if time, two times quoting. in a week, man. I, I'm getting a reputation of being a snowflake. I don't know why. <laughs> I guess I got to stop being nice. Um, well, okay. So it's been an interesting day. We've been talking about, uh, of course, uh, lots of history stuff, and we've gotten <laughs> even more. You know, it's been interesting. The last this whole month, we've been doing nothing but. Uh, uh, JFK, RFK, MLK, <laughs> and Jimmy Hoffa. Jimmy and, Hoffa. Yeah. He, and, I was devastated, Al. He's <laughs> not under Giant Stadium. Yeah. I want to believe that. I want that to be a Geraldo special. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. I can't wait. Um, so now okay, we're, we're going to be talking about D.B. Cooper um, and uh, kind of his, his, uh, his whole – thing that he did and uh, we've got uh, another great guest uh, he has a book that came out and it's getting to the truth i am db cooper and uh, his name is joe koenig thank you for being here joe you're welcome nice to be here so so joe let's let's talk about uh, your history and you uh, let's tell the audience uh, you've got a lot of history and, and, and knowledge that you're putting into this book. So let's let's start off with you. Uh, l let the audience know who you are. Well, I'm Joe Koenig. I retired from the Michigan State Police in 1993 after 26 years, spending almost all that time in investigations. And uh, coincidentally, I was the lead investigator for the state police on the Hoffa case. Um I retired in 93, and then I went into uh, working for a couple other public companies in investigations. And then I retired finally from uh, Hartford Financial in 19, excuse me, 2004. And then I opened up my KMI Investigations PI firm here in Michigan in 2005, and I've been working ever since. I have one book out. My first book was called Getting the Truth, not getting to the truth, but getting the truth. <clears throat> and then my second book is Getting the Truth, I am D.B. Cooper, just released. So what inspired you to write this book? What was your interest in, in D.B. Cooper? And, you know, what research did you put into this? The uh, the. Publisher, my publisher, Principia Media, Vern Jones is the owner. 
that's who I published my first book through. So I knew Vern. <clears throat> they received information uh, in early 2016 from one of their editors who said, hey, I've got uh, a, a source here who says he knows who D.B. Cooper is. Are you interested? So that led to uh, a couple meetings down in Florida. And then uh, Vern, once he realized that there was substance to uh, this source on D.B. Cooper, um, he called me in because of my investigative experience and expertise, and I picked it up and uh, ran with it. So I became active in this about mid-2016. Um, and what I had was uh, uh, three and a half hours of mini cassettes that weren't even dated or numbered. So we had no idea what order they, they were in. But those 10 mini cassettes contained tape recordings of discussions between Carl Lauren, mm -hmm. who uh, was the source, and is the best was the best friend of Walt Brecca, and uh, uh, those two started. Well, they became friends back in 1958 when both of them belonged to a skydiving club in Saginaw, Michigan, and they found an airport there, an airport owner who would allow them to to jump out of planes. Which uh, it was hard to find someone who ran an airport who would allow that, but they did. And they did a lot of jumps, experimenting with different parachutes. Um, I think uh, they even dropped out at 800 feet at some point, trying a little contest to figure out who could come closest to the earth before the chute opened. So they were crazy. Uh, <laughs> they became very, very good friends, as did all of them in that group. <clears throat> and... Uh, Carl, right after the uh, incident occurred in 1971, uh, November 24th, 1971, he saw a, a, a program that described what happened, and he felt immediately that it could have been, uh, that uh, Walt Recca could have been D.B. Cooper. So he worked. Uh, he had no contact with Walt at that time, so several years passed, and then they they finally got together, and Carl started uh, prying Walt for more information. <clears throat> Walt wouldn't give anything up, but he finally did. And then uh, Carl got permission to record conversations, and over the course of about four or five months, beginning in 2008, Carl recorded conversations with Walt, wherein Walt uh, confessed to being D.B. Cooper and gave uh, many, many, many details uh, that we think only the hijacker would have known. Mm -hmm. So then I took those mini cassette tapes and uh, to do a forensic linguistics analysis on it, I had to have it transcribed. And then it took uh, literally weeks to refine that to bring it to the standard I needed to really do some good analysis. So I did. And over those two years, I uh, not only did that analysis, I uh, read uh, from the FBI vault all their, the FBI 302 reports and the evidence they had published. Uh, we found... Uh, Two uh, other witnesses that I went and interviewed, um, actually three witnesses that I interviewed and uh, also did analysis of their interviews. And uh, in short, uh, everything checked out. Uh, Walt's information was corroborated by what would appear to be independent witnesses. Uh, the details that only the other person present would have known um, and in comparing the evidence the FBI has published with the 
information that Walt provided in his confession, I think there's uh, there is amazing similarities in uh, the conversations and the series of events that occurred. So I'm convinced Walt Recca is D.B. Cooper. Now, Joe, in, in all fairness, you know, me and Al, we, we've done several shows on D.B. Cooper, and okay. there's a lot of people that have confessed to being D.B. Cooper, and they're, they're able to, you know, give some general details. What did Walt say to you that kind of changed your mind or convinced you that this, this one out of this whole lineup is the one? Well, good question. Uh, there are a lot of things. Uh, for instance, he uh, he says he landed. Well, his conversations with the stewardess uh, were very, very specific, and uh, the chain of events that he describes, um, as far as I know, weren't known to the public beforehand. Now, I should tell you that Walt died in twenty. 14. Oh, and, man. Uh, he is, That's too bad. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I'd, uh, I'd like to have him was, on the show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, part, of the re- part of the reason uh, this wasn't released until now, actually in May of this year, uh, is because Carl made an, an agreement with Walt that he wouldn't use it until after Walter's death. So... Um, but one of the uh, couple of the interesting things that occurred was Walt described he jumped out of the plane uh, having <clears throat> uh, strapped just one parachute to his back. He uh, he had a raincoat that he stuffed the money inside, put the belt that he had on his pants around the raincoat, and then stuffed the money into his raincoat while he had it on after he had strapped on the parachute and then buttoned the raincoat all the way up. And then he jumped out the rear of uh, the 727. He landed in a field, um, actually hit a dead tree and broke his leg Ooh. near near Cleellum, Washington. He described as he was about to land, he saw some light in the distance. And uh, so once he landed, got himself together, took his parachute off, uh, just covered it with branches, didn't bury it, just covered it with branches. And again, it was cold and rainy. Uh, He took his raincoat off and then put all the money back into it and then rolled it up and put it under his arm and began walking toward the lights that he saw in the distance. Um, He, uh, as he was walking with that raincoat under his arm, in the rain, cold, uh, he is passed by a truck, a dump truck, that eventually pulls into uh, what appears to be a restaurant down the road. Walt then continues to walk to that restaurant, walks in, orders a coffee, sees a guy there who's dressed in cowboy gear and has a guitar. Uh, Walt asks the guy, uh, if I call a friend to pick me up, will you give him directions? And he goes to the phone in the restaurant, which is now identified as the Tianaway Cafe that uh, burned down mm, probably 10 years ago, and there's a fire station there now. Uh, and there, there's more to that story, how the, how the restaurant was located. Uh, but he asked this guy dressed as cowboy to uh, tell his friend where he is so that his friend can pick him up. And cowboy does that. And then cowboy leaves because he's doing a, uh, he's in a concert that night at the Grange Hall. He's a singer, and he's a pretty good one, by the way. Um, so uh, Walt gives those details in his statement in 2008. In 2013, Carl, after just before Walt dies, Carl tries to figure out uh, 
with all the details Walt provided. And Carl is a pilot. He's a commercial pilot, a very bright man, uh, not an investigator, but a very bright man and uh, knows uh, how to read charts. He's got a son who's in the airline uh, industry. And together they figure out, based upon what Walt has provided them, an area where he probably landed. Um, and also in the descriptions that Walt gives on how his his buddy, a guy by the name of Don Brennan, mm -hmm. who drove down from uh, his house, the directions he took to get there helped them as well. So what Carl did was he called a restaurant that appeared to be in the area and described to the to the woman who answered what he was looking for. He's looking for a restaurant, kind of like a truck stop, um, that was um, on the, a particular road. Yes, yeah, somewhere where said, you can blend in. Yeah, well, uh, I don't think he had much choice on where he landed, but because in those uh, the parachutes in those days, are, you know, you couldn't, they're non-directional. But at any rate, uh, she tells him, well, you must be talking about the Tianaway Cafe. And uh, so she describes that. She says, but that burned down seven or eight years ago. There's a fire station there now. So Carl, on his own, flew down into that area Um uh, went to that fire station and then noticed there was a, a repair shop, an auto repair shop across the street. It looked like it had been there for a while. And he went across the street and he said, hey, by any chance, uh, do you know a guy who uh, dresses like a cowboy, plays in a band and drives a drum truck? The guy <laughs> said, no. He said, but talk to the town historian." So we set him up, and, he, and Carl went and talked to the historian, say, asked the same question. The guy said, no, but maybe my son does. And uh, so Carl left his phone number and name and then had to leave the area. And a week later, a guy calls up Carl and says, uh, hey, I understand you're looking for me. Turns out this guy is Cowboy. And uh, he's not just a guy, he's a well-respected guy from the area, a former police officer, uh, just named in 2017, he was named King Cole for that area, which is a high honor. <laughs> so uh, Carl talks to him, and uh, Carl says, hey, by any chance, do you remember back in 1971, uh, the uh, uh, Thanksgiving Eve? Um being in a restaurant and talking to a guy. He says, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. And he gave the exact details that Walt had given uh, Carl earlier. So now we've got Cowboy identified. Um, also, in the discussion with Walt, Walt talked about once he uh, uh, got back home, what Walt did was he uh, lived in Heartline, Washington. And on the day of the, the day before the skyjacking, he drove his car to Spokane, parked his car in a parking lot, took a bus from Spokane to Portland, where he stayed overnight in a, in a, uh, a motel that he described pretty well that we think we've located. Uh, and then the next day he, he pulled off the, the skyjacking. He uh, uh, gave details on that. Um, but after he landed, was uh, retrieved by Don Brennan, taken back home. Walt worked as a welder at the Cooley Dam. And uh, the next day he, uh, he walked into work. And then uh, they noted that he had a broken leg, so they sent him to the doctor, the company doctor. And the doctor said, hey, uh, this isn't a recent break. I think it was a couple days later that he uh, had to report to work. But he felt it was important to report to work. Anyway, he went back to work. 
Uh, he, uh, the, the doctor said it was an old injury, but he repaired it. I'm getting, um, so the doctor repaired the leg, and then Walter went about his work um, at, the, uh, at the Cooley Dam. Now, he took some of his money, <clears throat> 200000 and used $20 bills. Uh, right. First of all, he gave, he gave Don Brennan several thousand dollars for picking him up. Um, but then he took his money and he bought a house in Spokane, described the street it was on. He gave us an address that wasn't, wasn't accurate, but, uh, it was close enough. Same street. I think the number was wrong. Um, and remember he's telling Carl this about 37 years after this occurred. So we look up the, uh, the address find uh, uh, Walt uh, listed in the Polk, the old Polk directories at that address. And uh, my editor interviews, finds and interviews, and uh, I think videotapes the, uh, the owner of that house who sold it to Walt. And the details the owner gave us were exactly the same details as Walt gave us. Corroboration again. Um, this guy uh, sold Walt the house on a land contract. He uh, he uh, always dealt cash. He says, matter of fact, if somebody came to me with a, even a bank check, he said I'd send it, send them back to the bank and tell them bring me cash. So he only dealt in cash. So it wasn't unusual for Walt to pay him in cash. Um, yeah. So yeah. we got a lot of a lot of corroboration. So. Yeah, let, let me ask you this. I mean, you you said a lot here, and and these are some points that <laughs> are, are are fairly common. Um, first of all, was Walt a military man? You know, where yeah, did he, he where did he learn? You know, I mean, we're, we're talking low altitude, low opening when it comes to the parachute, and yeah. also also um, me and Al before before the show we were kind of discussing this. You know, with some of the money that was lost, because if I remember right, some of this money was found in a river. Tenabar. Well, yes. Uh, would there be a chance of any type of DNA um, evidence today? Well, <clears throat> let me hit your first question. He was uh, had an honorable discharge from the Army, uh, paratrooping. Okay. He was also in the Air Force Reserve Para Rescue, which is a very elite squad that used to do jumps in very uh, uh, terrible weather conditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he had lots of experience. This is a guy who jumped. Uh, he used to do jumps in Alaska. He dressed as Santa Claus and jumped at a charity event in Alaska. There are some news articles on him where he jumped uh, dressed as Santa Claus to uh, help generate money for these charitable events. Anyway, his he had uh, the experience that it would have taken for uh, a guy to survive a jump like this. And actually, uh, somebody asked me about the broken leg. It wasn't unusual for Walt to, to uh, work with a broken leg. He had, uh, Carl told us, that he made a jump in Saginaw where he broke his leg. And then they went up for a second jump and Walt went and jumped with a broken leg. So the guy was uh, unbelievable. So he had uh, a great deal of training as a paratroop. Now, the Tenabar money, uh, we don't have a good explanation for that. Um, he gave... Uh, Don Brennan, several thousand dollars to pick him up. Now, it's possible it's, it's some of the money that Don Brennan would receive, but we don't have a real good explanation for that. We have some theories, but not good enough to uh, survive. Uh, y y you know, they're not as credible as all the other evidence we have. Right. Yeah. So, so... Okay, if he got medical treatment for the broken leg, um, 
because uh, man, I I want to find DB Cooper, and it seems yeah. you know that the going trend today is DNA evidence. During his treatment for this broken leg, did did they take blood tests or did they take any type of samples that we can definitively say, hey, this is the DNA of DB Cooper? And if we could, how would we match that to Walt? Well, Kevin, you know this is 1971. Uh, I know. DNA wasn't even a uh, wasn't even a thought in investigators' minds. Oh, let it's alone killing the me. FBI's minds. They, uh, you know, they had excellent DNA evidence in the Raleigh cigarettes. By the way, Walt smoked Raleigh cigarettes. Uh, in the Raleigh cigarettes, they confiscated it off the plane where the hijacker uh, was sitting. Uh, but uh, and and that would be good DNA evidence. However, uh, when you pick up DNA evidence or something like a cigarette or something damp, uh, if you don't store it correctly, it'll destroy itself. You know, it'll it'll contaminate and uh, uh, it's worthless. In this case, uh, the, the last I read, the FBI lost the the Raleigh cigarettes that were confiscated on the plane. Oh. And so those are no longer available. Now, there was some DNA evidence supposedly on the tie that was left behind in the plane. Um, but that wouldn't be as good as those cigarettes because only the skyjackers smoked those cigarettes, whereas the tie could have been, you know, worn by many different people. True. And uh, we're told that the DNA was not of the type that uh, was uh, particularly definitive. So uh, unlike the cigarettes, the cigarettes would have been perfect. So, uh, you know, I'm sure we could find some blood samples from Walt if we found DNA evidence, by all means, go for it. Mm -hmm. So what about the witnesses, um, people that that were on the plane with him? how many of those are still living and did you get an opportunity to speak with any of the witnesses who could, you know, perhaps, you know, I mean, this is like you said, 1971. If we had a photograph or a photographic lineup of, of Walt today, do you think that they would be able to identify him from a photo lineup? It's possible. We've got some pictures of Walt back when uh, in 1972, 71 ish. Uh, probably 72-ish, so it's possible, yeah. But remember, you know, we're in Michigan, and all that stuff is out there out west, and uh, it takes money. uh, uh, Vern Jones uh, funded a lot of this, but there was a lot of this I I would have liked to have, you know, done more work on, uh, Mm -hmm. but because of expenses, you know, we didn't. My point uh, in my book uh, that, by the way, has endorsements from um, judges, uh, the former uh, number two in charge of the FBI, Kathleen McChesney, uh, Jim Esposito, who worked the Hoffa case with me from the FBI special agent in charge of New Jersey office, uh, the former... uh, Inspector General for Social Security, who was an SAC for uh, Special Agent in Charge of Secret Service, uh, federal former U.S. attorneys, I have reviewed my book and given me uh, uh, their stamp of approval, their their endorsement that this is this is a case the FBI should review uh, because this is a very compelling case for. Walt Recca to be D.B. Cooper. Yes. Well, so I, well, urge you, I urge you to pick up my book. <laughs> I was just, uh, did you ever find out why he did it? Yeah, well, his his niece, uh, who was a gal by the name of Elisa Strong, um, asked him that because Walt actually gave Carl a uh a uh, dictated to Carl a confession, called it his last testament. In there is the phrase, I am D.B. Cooper. Uh, but I didn't use that 
uh, last testament in my analysis because even though it was dictated, um, Carl is a guy who uh, is not uh, very proficient in computers. He doesn't have an email, so everything you 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 communicate with him through his wife, who who is pretty good. But uh, Carl then took that dictation and then had a neighbor type it up for him and then took it to Walt for him to sign it. Uh, and then Walt's sister and niece uh, talked Walt out of signing it because he was still alive. And they said, hey, if you sign this, uh, in front of a notary, who knows what will happen. They could prosecute you for this. So he didn't sign it. Uh, but also because it was written by Carl, based on what he thought Walt told him, I didn't use it in my analysis. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of good details in that as well. But when uh, when his niece, Lisa, talk to him about, talk to Walt, why did you do this, Walt? Walt told Lisa, I'd rather be dead than poor. Walt grew up in Detroit uh, as a kid. His dad died at a very young age. His dad was electrocuted. And Walt kind of grew up on the streets of Detroit. So um, had a tough childhood, and he was tired of being poor. And he pulled this off so that he could give his kids something. What a what a way to do it! <laughs> yeah, Did, yeah. Were you yeah. able yeah. to yeah. talk to, talk to the kids or any of the family? I've talked to Lisa. Uh, I haven't talked to the to the family. Hmm. I was just wondering if the, if they knew about it, if they knew that that's who he was, or or if he told them. You know, what a legacy! There is, yeah, yeah. There is. Uh, he was very quiet about it. Um, th there's much more to this story because Walt had in his, and he would send all of this. He sent all of this information to Carl, uh, all the documents all the uh, identifications to Carl uh, after he opened up about being D.B. Cooper. He had identifications that were KGB identifications for Walt Recca. Uh, he had uh, uh, obviously fraudulent IDs where he would change the name from Walt Pika to Walt Recca with, uh, you know, by extending the uh, making a P into an R, uh, and you could see the different color ink. Uh, mm -hmm. I've got a picture of that in the book. It's just obvious. I used but to do he, that with my report cards. <laughs> he, uh, he had, uh, it, it's a very, very interesting case. The man um, has a, a, just an amazing history, and... Uh, you know, we've got vaccination documents that show he was vaccinated throughout these years for foreign travel. He was in Saudi Arabia. Uh, he's got a letter of commendation from the U.S., I think it's Army, on the basis of something he reported to them. I, I, I can't remember all the details right now, but he reported to them something that saved several troops' lives. And he's got a written commendation from some officer in the Army as a result. Uh, just an amazing guy. Now, he's a, he's a petty thief. I mean, he was convicted of an armed robbery in the Detroit area uh, of a big boy, uh, which he was convicted of, sentenced, and then he, he jumped, and he was wanted for that. Um, he he never wanted to go to jail, so um, you know he has he had a checkered past. He had a pizza place in Wixom, Michigan, for a while. He burned that down uh, for insurance money. So he's not a choir boy by any chance. Uh, he has a, a Robin Hood type quality about him because every time he does something, he usually gives. Uh, 
the people, the workers, part of his take, part of his money. Like uh, when he did the uh, big boy armed robbery, he uh, he gave the manager there some money. Um, and also on this skyjacking, he offered, uh, uh, he said $4,000 to the stewardess just before he jumped out. Wow. So, in, in 1971, that's a, that's a lot of money. Yeah. 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 That's a bundle of money. And the 200,000 back then is worth, I, I think a little over a million now. So, you know, people say, well, why do you only do it for 200,000? Well, you, you don't want to get too heavy when you jump out of a plane. So <laughs> true, <laughs> true. Because if he was a military man, he would understand that you know the, the packs that you have to drop before you actually hit ground it don't weigh much more than a hundred and hundred and ten pounds. Yeah, yeah. Now I I urge the FBI to to take a look at the evidence we have and. Um, I, it's very, very compelling. Uh, if if they have detailed conversations, you know, a lot of the people are dead and gone, uh, so they're not available. Uh, but if they have in their 302 some good detailed reports about conversations, uh, they'll be able to compare them to what Walt, Walt gave us here and uh, solve their case, I think. Do you think that they'll actually close it and solve it this way, or do you think they're going to want more? Or uh, It seems like some of the old cases they really kind of um, take their time on. Yeah, well, I would, I would want more um, if I were the Bureau before I would make sure. But they've, they've suspended their case, I think, in 2016. They suspended it. But, um, you know, they may, I hope they take a look at Kathleen McChesney, who is uh, – uh, like the number two uh, at the FBI. I'm not sure that was with Mueller or it might have been Louis Free. Um, but uh, Jim Esposito, former special agent in charge. I got federal prosecutors, uh, John Smetanka, uh, former U.S. attorney. Um, they think it's, it's worth taking a close look at. Yes. Mm. Now, have you heard anything from the D.B. Cooper community? Because I know that they're quite uh, vocal. And have you heard yeah. any opinions or feedback yet? <laughs> yeah, they have the following. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't talked to them, but our producer has, uh, <clears throat> uh, Vern Jones has, and Dirk Weringa have. Matter of fact, they went to the Cooper Con here uh, earlier in the year. <laughs> Cooper Con. Yeah. I have not heard that yet. Yeah. Yeah. and uh, made a presentation along with all the others. Uh, but it, by far, our case, uh, I think, of course, each of them thinks their case is, but we're not, we're not manipulating any, any evidence to prove that this is uh, D.B. Cooper. We're simply uh, letting the evidence that Walt gave us and the investigation we conducted and my analysis speak for itself. So we're, we're letting the evidence drive our conclusion and not uh, uh, a preconception driving our conclusion. Did, did you get any impression of how Walt felt um, about getting away with it? Walt, uh, you know, I, part of my analysis, I listened to the recordings, three and a half hours, several times and one of the things uh, part of the uh, forensic analysis is to in addition to the words that the people use uh, and in this case I didn't have a videotape just an audible um, but you, you listen for voice inflections volume uh, how quickly they respond to a question are there inordinate pauses are there any inconsistencies in his communication, be it just the audible portion? Are there any inconsistencies there that, uh, or communication patterns that change during that three and a half hours? So that's primarily what I was looking for as I listened to um, those tapes. And 
he was amazingly consistent throughout. His attitude was more of a guy who was kind of embarrassed about it, not not bragging about it at all. Uh, he was very, very um, downplayed any brilliance on his part, saying that really he didn't have a plan at all. He just did it. Um, that he didn't read about it. He wanted to forget about it. And he was reluctant to, uh, to confess to it, but he finally did to uh, his best friend, Carl, because Carl was such a good, trusted, uh, loyal friend. Uh, he said, I just can't lie to you anymore, Carl. So that's the reason he gave it up to, to Carl. Hmm. Pretty interesting. Well, what, yeah. what what other what other impressions did you get from listening and and analyzing his voice? Well, I didn't analyze his voice other than to listen for communication patterns. So uh, I, I like to I like to listen. To, you know, does he emphasize one word more than another? What kinds of words does he use? Does he use um, informal phrases in his speech? as he's moving on, when he's talking about, I mean, do those, you know, typically you'll see informal phrases in low stress situations where it's an informal discussion between you and a friend, for example, uh, about uh, something that isn't threatening. Now you would expect that uh, as the stress goes up, or as you talk about something that you're lying about, for instance, uh, you might be less inclined to be consistently using those informal phrases. So I listened to what words he used, how he used them, how he pronounced them, uh, his breathing, uh, the pauses between uh, once the question was asked and uh, the answer was given. Um, there's a lot you can tell from listening to that with that with that analysis in mind to see if there are changes in how he responds. And it's those changes that a forensic linguist uh, really looks for. That's what I look for. Inconsistencies. In, uh, yeah, you kind of get a, a, a fix on their communication pattern. And then you look for changes in those patterns. Hmm. And then you try to explain what caused that change. Was it a loud noise? Was it uh, uh, he suddenly uh, got somebody knocked on his front door? Was it, uh, was it deception? You know, that sort of thing. You, gotta, you have to then drill down and try to figure out the reason behind the communication pattern change. There is a reason, just have to find it. Hmm. So have you got a website or something that people can find you on if they have any comments or want to review your stuff? I do. I do. Of course, the book is the best source, but um, my website is www.kmiinvestigations.com, all one word. KMIinvestigations.com. Two eyes together and an S on the end. Fantastic. Now, so we'll have your book uh, linked as well and your site on our website so people can just go one click, pick up the book, find out the details on, on, on all your information. Uh, what, what have you got planned next? Well, I've got a... I've, I'm doing some book readings here. We just released it uh, last week. So I had uh, a book reading at a large bookstore here in Grand Rapids last uh, Wednesday, another one last Thursday in uh, Ann Arbor, and then I've got one tomorrow <clears throat> at a bookstore in Okemos, Michigan, Schuler's Books. And uh, and then I'm, I'm doing a number of interviews busy busy well <laughs> i really appreciate you coming on the show talk about the book your research information uh, our guest joe koenig thank you very much for being here 
Thank you. Thank you, Alan and Kevin. Thank you. Legacy Food Storage. The best way to protect your family is by being prepared. Go now to LegacyFoodStorage.com. Use coupon code HOM15 now for 15% off. Quick, go. Welcome to Stephen's True Crime Commentary. Discussions of forensics, how it's done, and true crime interest. Hello, welcome back to Stephen's True Crime Commentary, and as always, I am Stephen David Lampley. Last time we began our series on blood spatter analysis, and today we're going to continue with part two. Uh, we also have a handout for this, and you can find that on my website. That's www.stephendavidlampley.com forward slash handouts. Handouts is plural. H-A-N-D-O-U-T-S. www.stephendavidlampley.com forward slash handouts. You can either print the handout out. It's a PDF or you can follow along online. Either way, whichever you prefer. We have made the handouts printer friendly. They have uh, half inch margins and they print out either way, color or black and white. So you're welcome to have the handout if you wish. All right, there are three basic configurations of blood spatter as they relate to velocity. Now, when we talk about velocity of blood spatter, we are not talking about the speed of the blood. We're talking about the speed of the force that causes the blood spatter. In other words, the club or the knife or the gun, the speed of which the instrument has taken to cause the blood spatter. These three are all on the handout, so you're welcome to follow along with that. The first one is low velocity impact blood spatter. Now this is typically uh, the spatter or the markings left just simply by, by the gravitational force of the blood. In other words, drip. Just basically dripping from the finger or head or whatever onto the floor. Now these stains are typically 4 millimeters in diameter or greater. The next impact blood spatter is medium velocity and this is usually blood excuse me usually a force traveling greater than 25 feet per second now these stains are typically from 1 to 4 millimeters in diameter and usually as a result of beatings or stabbings or something similar in that nature the third type is the high velocity impact blood spatter and this is a velocity of over 100 feet per second and the stains typically are less than one millimeter in diameter and usually the result of a gunshot or an explosion a high speed collision or something like that uh, these usually have a mist like appearance all right we're going to talk to you about angles of impact a blood drop falling from your finger to the floor will result in a circular blood spatter when it hits the floor. In other words, you have a drop of blood drops from your finger onto the floor. What you're going to get is a circular blood drop on the floor. Now, if you were to take your finger as the blood is dripping off of it and flip it ever so slightly, the blood is going to travel through the air at an angle. Now, when, what happens when that, when that takes place is when the blood hits the floor, it's going to hit the floor at an angle, and the blood spatter is going to be more elongated because the blood drop has been traveling at an angle. It's going to look more like an oval than a circle. Now, if you go back and you were to flip your finger a little harder as the blood drop falls off, the angle that the blood is traveling in the air is going to be greater because the force that you flipped your finger is greater. So when the blood hits the floor, it's going to be at a greater angle and it will take the shape of an even more elongated oval. 
The angle of impact determines the blood drop pattern. So the greater the angle, the more elliptical or elongated the drop of blood will be upon impact. In computing the angles, forensics experts or investigators use trigonometric functions and three-dimensional trajectories in order to compute and make a 3D model of the blood spatter in the area of convergence. We're not going to get into all the mathematical equations. That's, that's for another person at another time. We're, we're going to give you some basic information on that. Now we're going to stop here. I know this was a, a short session. We're going to stop here because next time I, I don't want to split up the next commentary. Next time we're going to talk about points and area of convergence. Uh, we're going to talk about area of origin, cast off stains, transfers, arterial patterns, and a wide variety of different other uh, blood spatter types. So I really enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of this. And I will see you next time. Thank you for tuning in to Stephen's True Crime Commentary. And we welcome you to check out Stephen's book, Outside Your Door, a collection of true crime stories right from Stephen's case file and street experience. You want true crime? Let Stephen take you to the streets with him. It doesn't get much more real than from the officer and undercover SVU detective himself. Five star rated with Amazon, Barnes, and Noble, and books a million. Real cases. Real stories. Real people. Outside Your Door, by Stephen David Lampley. Crime Commentary is a production of Something Weird Media and West 53rd Productions with music by JasonLampley.com To find out more about our show, guests, or listen to a previous show, visit our website at www.somethingweirdmedia.com Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.